2023 marks the 75th anniversary of the arrival of the Empire Windrush, the event which marks the beginning of the mass migration which saw hundreds of thousands of Caribbean migrants settle in the UK to rebuild post-war Britain. Despite reconstructing the country and contributing to the British way of life, the Windrush generation faced years and decades of discrimination, mistreatment and racism. The Windrush generation deserve an applause. So to mark the 75th anniversary of Windrush, I'm going on a journey to explore the impact that the Caribbean society and community have had on the UK. West Indian culture has undeniable presence across the UK, particularly in London, where Jamaican Patois has contributed to an increasingly popular dialect called multicultural London English, also referred to as MLE. But what is MLE? Well, it's something that has happened I suppose after the Second World War, when, when the, the people came over from Jamaica and other places in the Caribbean, they then had kids, or they brought their kids, who then started sort of settling here and settling into the school system here, and began speaking Cockney. But they also developed something that's been called uh, London Jamaican. Okay. Which is a kind of version of Jamaican patois, as spoken in Jamaica, but with a London twang. And then as time went on, we're talking 60s, 70s now, uh, people came in from other places, particularly India, Pakistan, Bangladesh to start with. So then the mix was no longer just Caribbean and the local English uh, spoken in London. It was then people who spoke other languages. So you end up then with a proto version of multicultural London English. So how has the Caribbean contributed to MLE? I think it's contributed in two areas. One is slang. So there's a lot of slang uh, that, that, that's used in MLE. It's, it's used in music as well. So things like wagwan, mandem. Yeah. So that's the slang. And that mostly comes from the Caribbean, Jamaica probably. Um, but the other areas are pronunciation. So for instance, I have, I have a word like go. Uh, so I would say go. Uh, a Londoner might say go. And uh, an MLE speaker might say go. And uh, a Caribbean speaker might well say go as well. So it's possible that that comes from the Caribbean. I mean, one, one thing that's probably worth thinking about is the relationship of multicultural London English and black music in London. Yeah. Um, so there have been all, all sorts of genres, uh, ska, calypso, dance hall and so on, in London and Jamaica down through the, the decades until you get grime with people like Dizzy Rascal. And so the, the language then it seems to have sort of focused on the, the sort of slang that's, that's used in the Caribbean and also London. Would you say that that's helped with the popularity of MLE? Absolutely, it, it has. It's, it's made it really quite central in, in people's minds. Even if they don't have a name for it, they recognise this way of talking. Not everyone sees Emily as a good thing. What do you have to say for, for, for people that look down on people like that? I, I guess the, be the best thing is to, to actually try to educate people to understand that these dialects are dialects and are perfectly good kinds of language. Um, and then to give people opportunities to, to actually also to acquire standard English, which I think they do pretty much automatically anyway. So you need to attack it from both ends, I think. But it's a really tough one. As Paul alluded to, one of the biggest driving forces in popularising MLE is music. And British music is another area that has been heavily influenced by West Indian culture. Sound system culture and scars seeped through into British culture in the 1950s and 60s, but the Caribbean's influence has found a way to dominate the mainstream world through genres such as grime, dubstep, DMB, and even pop. The Caribbean influence on British popular music is an area which has been studied in depth by Michael Riley, the director of the Black Music Research Unit at the University of Westminster. You've previously said that Jamaican music has contributed a lot to UK pop culture. What, what do you mean by that? When we talk about Windrush, they arrived before pop. Caribbean black music has been here contributing to British popular music in a way that the wider public should understand. I mean, even the Beatles, where they were rehearsing in Liverpool in the cavern, you had a band called The Shades, who were one of our first a cappella bands. They're rehearsing alongside the Beatles. So there's this relationship that's been there the whole time. So what other genres would you say have been influenced by the Windrush generation? Without doubt, all, all genres. Sound system culture moved music from an indoor experience to predominantly 
outside listening experience. So rave culture we wouldn't have in the way that we have it without sound system culture. The sound of the music in terms of the bottom end, the bass, is a outcome from the African Caribbean community. The remix is a phenomenon that comes out again of the culture. Even the language has changed because of the Jamaican vernacular mm. and so forth. We have British rap, jungle, drum and bass, two-step, UK garage, grime, you know, drill. It's fashion, it's dance, it's language as well. It's British cool. It has a lot to be thankful for, for this community being here. So why do you think Caribbean music has been able to influence so many genres in the UK? Perhaps one of the first reasons is it's English language based. Added to that, what we have across the Caribbean is the first uh, cosmopolitan cities where you have a whole mix of cultures coming together in one space and being creative. And that translates back into the colonial touring circuit, if you like, which has existed since the 1800s. So there's a familiarity with this music coming in with a language that people understand. Would you say there's other areas in the Caribbean that probably need to have more recognition when, you, when you, you're talking about the music? Well, absolutely. I mean, it, the, the, anyone, I'm from, my parents are Jamaican, so we used to look at all the other islands as the smaller <laughs> islands. So, <laughs> gotta be careful. But, I mean, if you're from Barbados, you're from Trinidad, yeah. uh, Antigua, any of the other islands, you might have the argument to say, look, we contributed too. And Calypso, Carnival, is a big part of that, that narrative. I mean, it's the biggest street festival in Europe. There is an argument to say they should have more of a say, be more profiled in that conversation. What do you think it would look like without that Windrush generation's impact? How important would you say that it is celebrated like we are doing and, and like we do year on year? We're talking about 75 years. And so it's important, I think, to reintroduce these contributions in a way that uh, a contemporary audience can understand, but it's also recognising the people that previously contributed and celebrating them in a way that's loud and visual so that the system uh, can't get away with what it's trying to do. After speaking to Michael, it's clear to see the effect that Caribbean culture has had on British popular music. However, it's not the only aspect of West Indian life that has hit the mainstream world in the UK, as Caribbean cuisine is popular with many Brits up and down the country. These days, you're never too far away from Caribbean restaurants such as Original Flavour in Brixton, which is opened by South London brothers, Craig and Sean McEnough. Since 2016, they have been elevating Caribbean cuisine in the UK through cookbooks, TV appearances, and fun YouTube videos. So this journey started in your grandmother's kitchen. Did she ever tell you stories about how the UK was when she first came? She came to this country in 1956, it was really tough for her, you know? And she actually found a place around here where she um, brought up uh, seven kids, it was it seven oh, kids? Yeah. After the war, Caribbean restaurants was mainly for West Indian migrants to have like a hub. What would you say places like this is for people in our society now? Exactly the same thing. So it goes on the ethos of the Caribbean culture. You know what I mean? Family, get together. When there's a get together, there's a lot of food. Mm. And when there's a lot of food, there's a lot of people as well. Jamaica's motto is, out of many, one people, mm. which means, you know, a different people from all around the world coming together. And that's what Jamaicans kind of did. They kind of embraced different cuisines and cultures and brought it into our, their food. Mm. And that's what we do at Market House Bricks in our, in our menu. Amazing. What, what makes Caribbean cuisine different to any other culture? Caribbean food is definitely the best food because it's not just the taste, it's the love that goes into it. Yeah. It's starting Sunday dinner on Friday night, you know what I mean? Going to the, the market and having a relationship with the butcher and the fishmonger and the vegetable man. And it's like a story. Nowadays, you're seeing celebrities, you're seeing master chefs delve into, you know, making Caribbean food. Where do you draw the line between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation? I guess it's, it all depends. It's do you, do depends you ever you. see anything where you're like, that's not how you make oxtail. I mean, yeah, 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 that's not how you make jerk absolutely. chicken. Jerk chicken that has a base seasoning, right? Mm. You've got to have the pimento, the scotch bonnet, um, the thyme, you know, the garlic, things like that. Those are like the fine main ingredients. Mm. If it hasn't got that, yeah. it's, not, it's not jerk, <laughs> yeah, yeah. basically. At all, so. you've got to respect where the food's coming from because yeah. a lot of, of hurt and pain and strife has come from mm why we make certain dishes it came from like a place where in terms of slavery where we were given like discarded parts of meats or yeah. the thrown away vegetables and yeah. it's inspired our people um to make like saturday soup it, it might not be 
the most pleasant thing, but yeah. it was what they were had Great access to, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it made it into a real yeah. um, delicious dish. So aside from Jamaican food, what other Caribbean cuisines do you like? Trini um, doubles, always loved those. I think when the first time we made it, bro, we were like, wow, this is like. Like That's straight nice competition, yeah, straight yeah, yeah. competition for fried proper. dumpling. Like, okay. proper, yeah. like in terms of fried dumpling, I can sort fish. Mm-hmm. Like in terms of our favourites and yeah, doubles, man. That's like how we highly rank, rank it. Yeah, they're all quite similar, mm. but it just have different names a bit. So, okay. um, we Jamaicans have saltfish fritters. Mm. And like Trini or Bajan is like fish cakes. I'm hungry now. And now, guys, I appreciate you for sitting down with me. Okay. I can't wait to see what happens with original flavour. You guys have done so much already, but. I can't wait to see what the future holds, and thank you, thank you. Language, music and food are just three ways that the Caribbean migrants have helped shape everyday life here in the UK. West Indians and British culture have merged in ways that didn't seem possible 75 years ago. And one of the biggest ways this happened is something that is monumental in black British culture, and that is Notting Hill Carnival that happens annually in West London, where people come from all over the world, millions of people, to celebrate the food, the sound, and the vibes of the Caribbean culture. That is just another undeniable example of how dominant the Caribbean culture is in the UK. 